Before I begin the formal part of my presentation, I would first like to thank Michael Morand and the phenomenal staff at the Beinecke for this invitation and their tireless work in connecting scholars to the materials that allow the world to see, know, and understand our shared humanity in ways that might bring new insight. My transformative encounter with Langston Hughes writing occurred right here on Yale's campus, not too far from the Beinecke in Woolsey Hall. I was a senior at the University of Connecticut and traveled to New Haven to hear a solo recital given by opera legend Leontine Price. On that awe-inspiring night, the audience was favored with a tour de force recital that included many of the arias Miss Price was well known for, along with a wonderful array of art songs. It was on the second half of that program in a group of English language art songs that I heard a selection by composer Margaret Bonds. It was Miss Price's voice, Margaret Bonds' music, and Langston Hughes' words that would inspire my artistic development, arouse my intellectual curiosity, and transform my career trajectory as an artist, a scholar, and teacher. The poem that I heard of Langston Hughes's that night was this. Because my mouth is wide with laughter and my throat is deep with song, you do not think I suffer after I've held my pain so long. Because my mouth is wide with laughter, you do not hear my inner cry. Because my feet are gay with dancing, you do not know. I die. Up until that point in my studies, I had performed the standard repertoire most undergraduate voice students study. I sang early Italian songs, Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, and Strauss Lieder, Foray and Poulenc Melody, along with opera roles in Puccini, Offenbach, and Britain operas. While I had performed spirituals on my junior recital, I had yet to have the experience of singing poetic settings that spoke to the very core of my own existence as a Black person. What I did not understand then is that I was developing as a musician and a technician, but I wasn't really developing as an artist. Because to develop an artist, one must begin to grapple with the totality of their humanity to offer something to an audience that speaks to our shared humanity. It was several years later that another fateful door would open on my journey with Hughes. I was appointed artist in residence at the first historically black college in the country, Lincoln University. Lincoln just so happens to be where Hughes received his bachelor's degree after leaving Columbia University. That residency culminated in my first solo recital of all Hughes texts and would be the catalyst for my return to school to pursue a doctor of music at Florida State University, where I would continue researching and performing Hughes inspired works. Today, I want to share with you a brief overview of how my doctoral treatise, The Poetic Voice of Langston Hughes and American Art Song, developed into a course on American song literature and how that course grew into the course I'm currently teaching here at the Yale School of Music. These courses represent the culmination of my research and performing work to date and are also my attempt to address the very important challenge in the academy today, which is offering coursework that is more diverse and inclusive. In the specific case of the, mu of the music programs grounded in the Western art music tradition, my aim has been to diversify the composers we study while continuing to ground students' foundational knowledge in the Western art music canon. What we find continually is that inclusion of people representing non-centered identities does not mean the exclusion of those upon which traditions have been built. 
by examining American music through the lens of Langston Hughes' historical context, life, and writings, it is my assertion that we can impart knowledge in a way that is more racially inclusive, more inclusive with regard to gender and sexuality, and more broadly representative of musical figures who come from various places in America's wide class chasm. Why might this even be necessary? Central to the mission of the Yale School of Music is to educate and inspire students with exceptional artistic and academic talent for service to the profession and to society, and to prepare them for roles as cultural leaders. It is my further assertion that if we are to be effective in executing that mission, we must ensure that our students are offered the broadest possible lens through which they see and understand the totality of the culture in order to effectively lead that culture without continuing to perpetuate biases along class, gender, and racial constructs. Now to the heart of the matter. The intersection of poetry and music has been a topic of discussion in scholarly musical circles for a long time. The marriage of these two art forms has inspired centuries of art and entertainment. In the performance of vocal music, the literary figures responsible for inspiring the musical product are often relegated to a brief mention or a footnote, if mentioned at all, except in the rare cases where their work garners greater attention. In Germany, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe is the predominant figure in literature responsible for inspiring works in various genres of music. His writings, along with those of Joseph von Eichendorf, Heinrich Heine, Eduard Mördecke, and Friedrich Rückert, form the literary foundation of musical romanticism. In France, Victor Hugo is often noted as the figure that provided literary inspiration credited with elevating French melody to prominence and providing Italian opera with a continued stream of politically charged plots. Beyond the romantic musings of Hugo, it is the various schools of French poetry, Parnassianism, symbolism, and surrealism, that, and their corresponding champions, Paul Verlaine, Charles Baudelaire, and Guillaume Apollinaire, among them, which lead melody out of the age of romanticism and into the 20th century. It is in the 20th century that the United States becomes the venue where art song continues to flourish. In American music, Langston Hughes is one of the literary figures that hold a place similar to the aforementioned literary luminaries. In the literary field, Hughes is respected as one of the most important figures of the 20th century. With the rise of Black studies as an academic field in the 1970s, his life, writing, and influence has received frequent attention. What had not been documented in more specific terms is him, his importance to America's musical culture in the 20th century. Whether directly or indirectly, Langston Hughes has been a fixture in American music culture, both popular and concert music, since the 1920s. In addition, his personal affinity for blues, jazz, and other specifically Black musical forms, such as gospel music, has his vast contribution to American music specifically and American music culture in a broader sense can be separated into four general categories. First, as a writer of lyrics for songs in support of workers' rights in the 1930s and in support of the war effort in the 1940s. Second, as a writer of lyrics for musical reviews and works suitable for Broadway. Third, as a librettist for opera, chief among them William Grant Still's Troubled Island and Kurt Vile's Street Scene. And finally, as a poet for art song settings by a distinguished array of composers. The study of American art song, that is, 
lyric poetry set to music specifically for voice and piano is generally centered around a well-known cadre of distinguished composers. Some of those composers are Stephen Foster, Amy Beach, Charles Ives, John Alden Carpenter, Aaron Copeland, Samuel Barber, Lee Hoiby, and Dominic Argento, just to name a few. The poets most often encountered are James Agee, E.E. E. Cummings, James Joyce, Walt Whitman, Emily Dix Dickinson, again, just to name a few. What you might notice is a list of composers who are mostly men and all white. And not that there is anything wrong with either of those identities, but if we are to understand American culture and American music in the broadest sense, it might be useful to frame our studies in a way that actually includes all of what America was at its founding and all that America has become since. When I centered the study of American art song around the poetry of Langston Hughes, something quite remarkable happened. We continued to study composers like Samuel Barber and John Alden Carpenter, while including composers like Margaret Bonds, William Grant Still, Robert Owens, Dorothy Rudd Moore, Ellie Ziegmeister, and Florence Price. Again, just to name a few. And this does not include the body of work by living composers like John Musto and Ricky Ian Gordon, who have also set Hughes' text. While it would be easy to dismiss or belittle this frame as a black and white issue along a racial binary, what I find even more important is the way framing the study of American art song around Hughes moves women composers from a position that is often tokenistic in nature to a central place in the study where a diverse body of women are included. Shifting to the course I taught for the first time this year, the literary voice of Langston Hughes in American music begins with an overview of the musical landscape into which Hughes was born in 1901. We begin by examining the group of composers known as the Second New England School. I begin with Amy Beach, George Chadwick, Arthur Foote, Edward McDowell, John Knowles Payne, and Horatio Parker for several reasons. The Boston Six, as they were also known, are pivotal figures in understanding America's Western art music identity. The presence of Horatio Parker, most well known as Charles Ives' uh, teacher, places Yale University as a central academic hub for America's Western art music identity, and the presence of the first woman composer to have her music performed by a, mer a major American orchestra at least gives us some amount of diversity upon which to build. Continuing with the overview of the musical landscape into which Langston Hughes was born, we examine the legacy of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Studying the Fisk Jubilee Singers gives an opportunity to examine the presence of spirituals in American music. It also provides a bit more geographic diversity since America cannot be thoroughly understood through the lens of New Englanders alone. It also gives us a window into academic institutions beyond the elite conservatories and the Ivy League to introduce historically black colleges and universities which are central in Hughes' life. As part of this introduction to concert spirituals, we also consider an essay by Helen, written by a Harlem Renaissance luminary and early literary partner to Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston. In her essay, Spirituals and Neo-Spirituals, Hurston challenges our understanding of spirituals when seen only through the lens of arrangements in the Western classical tradition, and challenges us to see from her vantage point as an anthropologist, these, these spirituals in their authentic form. 
and to view the concert spirituals as an outgrowth of the original, but not the original itself. Hence the term neo-spiritual. And finally, to complete this foundational overview, we introduce blues and ragtime. Popular forms were not topics I ever studied in my own musical training. However, it is my belief that even for students preparing to enter the world of classical music performance, understanding popular music movements gives all of us a better understanding of the musical ecosystem of the country for which classical music is only one part and hopefully help students to balance, ide uh, to balance ideals that promote art for the sake of art and ideals that center art that is relevant to the moment and created for a specific purpose. By exploring music that emanates from both ideals, we develop musicians with a broader understanding of music in general, we expose them to the inherent diversity of American culture, and hopefully help them to see their own identity and existence as uniquely valuable to the continued evolution of humankind. Building on that musical overview of the context into which Langston Hughes was born, listening to Amy Beach's Gaelic Symphony, Charles Ives' The Unanswered Question, Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag, and examining the life of band leader James Reese Europe, we turn to Langston Hughes himself examining his childhood in Kansas, his move to Ohio, his challenged relationship with his father, his first nationally poet published poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, Rivers, and his landmark essay, The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain. The music we examine alongside this study are two settings of The Negro Speaks of Rivers, one by composer Howard Swanson and the other by the composer who is arguably the most important musical relationship Hughes would have when examining his influence on music in the Western art music tradition, Margaret Bonds. Both the poem and the essay are foundational writings upon which we can build our understanding of Hughes' work. Not only was, was black identity central, the lives of the black poor and working class were viewed as equally worthy of artistic treatment and depiction as any other subject in American life. The course continues with an examination of the influence of blues on Hughes' writing, the growth of jazz as a uniquely American musical genre and Hughes' unique role as being influenced by both genres, writing poetry that bears that influence, and inspiring composers that would ultimately produce music bearing elements of both America's American art music's European heritage, as well as Black folk idiom. This section of the course highlights Langston Hughes' performances with Charlie Mingus as a well uh, as well as an examination of many of the drivers of jazz in the 20th century. In looking at the legacy of Duke Ellington specifically, I have found it particularly interesting to observe student reaction to three different versions of his composition in a sentimental mood written in the 1930s. The first is played by the composer himself in its original instrumental only form. The second recording I offer is an arrangement of the original for voice, guitar, and double bass with lyrics penned by Irving Berlin and Manny Kurtz. The singer on the recording I play is Sarah Vaughn. The final recording of this, sta this jazz standard I share is a recording for voice and piano performed by operatic soprano Renee Fleming. I would encourage you to find these three renditions on YouTube so you can hear how this work written in 1931, recorded by Sarah Vaughan in 1961, and then performed by Renee Fleming 40 years after that, continues to be a beloved tune to lovers of jazz and opera alike. 
The course goes on to discuss challenges Hughes faced in some of his collaborative relationships, specifically his relationship with Zora Neale Hurston and later composer William Grant Still, and the perils of artistic patronage. While often necessary for artists who do not come from financial means, artistic patronage can inadvertently rob an artist of their independence and narrow the scope of their art to satisfy the desires of the patron rather than grounding themselves in their own inspiration. While this module of the course doesn't include specific musical examples, the discussion is quite important for highly talented, budding professionals who can glean from the experience of artists in other fields and in another time. It also helps them to understand some of the unique challenges of artists representing non-centered identities when entering highly specialized artistic arenas. The course continues with a discussion of Langston Hughes' political engagement and by proxy other artists responding to the politics of the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. Among them, Marian Anderson and Paul Robeson. Discussing these three artists together offers students three distinctly different ways artists might respond to the political travails of their time. Marian Anderson responded with her singing and, and presence almost exclusively. Actor and singer Paul Robeson responded with his, his art but also carved out specific space in his career to speak to the country's failings as he saw them. Hughes, in a sense, did a combination of the two. Although Hughes failed on several occasions to initiate an artistic collaboration with Hughes, they both share the distinction of being called to testify before Senator Joseph McCarthy's subcommittee on un-American activities. Students have been riveted while listening to Marian Anderson's famous performance on the steps of the, Link of the Lincoln Memorial in 1939, and Paul Robeson's testimony before the McCarthy Commission some 15 years later. Again, Langston Hughes finds himself at the center of artistic movements of the 20th century and activism of the time. While this did not come without real consequence, Hugh's commitment to centering Black people in his work remained and became the foundation for seeing downtrodden humanity of all races, genders, and socioeconomic status as worthy of dignity, respect, and representation in all artistic spheres. The course concludes with four additional units. The first, Langston Hughes' The Playwright, which highlights Hughes' work for the stage but giving particular space to his musical reviews and gospel plays. Understanding gospel music's lineage from the blues is central in understanding why Langston Hughes, who had a rather precarious relationship with religion after, after a childhood incident at a revival meeting in Kansas, might be interested in writing plays that included gospel music in its scope. Once again, it was the blues inspiring Hughes. We often think that spirituals are the foundation for gospel music. However, spirituals are a unique folk idiom that are often included in church wor worship, but that in and of itself does not make it gospel music. Because gospel music is so central to my own musical foundation, this unit is particularly gratifying to teach. Later this weekend, I, along with staff members from the Beinecke, will be leading New Haven High School students in an examination of one of Hughes' gospel plays, The Black Nativity, using the vast array of materials housed in the Beinecke. The next of the final four units in Langston Hughes is Langston Hughes, the opera librettist. In this unit, we cover two important landmarks in Hughes' career. First, the premiere of Troubled Island, the first opera presented by a major American composer, excuse me, by, by American, a major American opera company by a composer, a black composer and librettist. William Grant Still 
often referred to as the dean of African-American composers, was often the only black composer covered in examinations of American classical music. His Afro-American symphony is a landmark, but his operas are particularly noteworthy aspects of his compositional output. In recent years, Opera Theater of St. Louis mounted a production of his opera, Highway One. Personally, I've had the wonderful opportunity to sing the tenor lead in his opera, A Bayou Legend, with one of the, with, with one of the original cast members of A Bayou Legend, the late soprano, Carmen Balthrop. The Mississippi Educational Television Authority presented a Bayou legend on TV in 1981, marking the first time an opera by a black composer was broadcast on television. In addition to a Bayou legend, this unit of the course also includes a discussion of Hughes' collaboration with playwright Elmer Rice and composer Kurt Weil on an operatic adaptation of Rice's play Street Scene. Although usually treated as an opera, Street Scene premiered on Broadway in 1947 and won the inaugural Tony Award for Best Original Score. For Hughes, it would mark his the most profitable endeavor of his career and enable him to purchase the home he lived in for the last 20 years of his life at 20 East 127th Street in Harlem. This home is now considered a historical landmark. Next, we offer a synthesized version of the art song discussion we had earlier. This is a particularly gratifying unit to share with students because we have, uh, excuse me, the, the section on art song is then followed by um, a section that we finish the course with that covers choral settings of Langston Hughes texts. This is a particularly gratifying unit to share with students because we have two current members of the Yale community um, of international renown, renown who have set Hughes. In this unit, we feature Doctor of Musical Arts student Joel Thompson's work titled Hold Fast to Dreams. The text uses two well-known Hughes poems, Harlem and Dreams. One poem summarizes the pain of broken promises and the other encourages faith that things will get better. We also feature visiting professor of choral conducting Andre Thomas's setting of the Hughes poem, I Dream a World. We complete this unit and the course in a sense where we began with two larger scale choral works by composer Margaret Bonds for which Hughes wrote the lyrics. Ballad of a Brown King and Simon Bore the Cross are two works, one for the Christmas holiday and the other for the Easter season. In both works, the traditional stories of these holidays are told through the, the lens of black figures central to the story. Simon of Cyrene, the African who helped Jesus carry the cross to Golgotha, and King Balthazar, one of the three magi who has been described as African or dark-skinned in legends and artistic representations dating back to the Middle Ages. In closing, my research and performance of musical settings of Langston Hughes poetry is ongoing. Just recently, I spent a week with students at Bethune-Cookman University in Daytona Beach, Florida, a place where Hughes himself offered poetry readings and had a strong relationship with the university's founder, Mary McLeod Bethune. That residency included a lecture entitled Langston Hughes, The Artist and the Activist, and a solar recital of works by Margaret Bonds, Ricky Ian Gordon, Robert Owens, Hale Smith, and Kurt Vile. The course I've outlined for you today will continue to evolve in the years to come and will be offered to students across the university and not just to the music students beginning next spring. <laughs>